This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Laura Dornan. What Katie Did by Susan Coolidge. Chapter 2 Paradise. The place to which the children were going was a sort of marshy thicket at the bottom of a field near the house. It wasn't a big thicket, but it looked big, because the trees and bushes grew so closely that you could not see just where it ended. In winter the ground was damp and boggy, so that nobody went there, except in cows, who don't mind getting their feet wet. But in summer the water dried away, and then it was all fresh and green, and full of delightful things. Wild roses, and sassafras and bird's nests. Narrow winding paths ran here and there, made by the cattle as they wandered to and fro. This place the children called Paradise, and to them it seemed as wild and endless and full of adventure as any forest of fairyland. The way to Paradise was through some wooden bars. Katie and Cece climbed these with a hop, skip and a jump, while the smaller ones scrambled underneath. Once past the bars they were fairly in the field, and, with one consent, they all began to run till they reached the entrance of the wood. Then they halted with a queer look of hesitation on their faces. It was always an exciting occasion to go to Paradise, for the first time after the long winter. Who knew what the fairies might not have done, since any of them had been there to see? "'Which path shall we go in by?' asked Clover at last. "'Suppose we vote,' said Katie. "'I say by the Pilgrim's Path and the Hill of Difficulty.' "'So do I,' chimed in Clover, who always agreed with Katie. "'The Path of Peace is nice,' suggested Cece. "'No, no, we want to go by Sassafras Path,' cried John and Dory. However, Katie, as usual, had her way. It was agreed that they should first try Pilgrim's Path, and afterward make a thorough exploration of the whole of their little kingdom, and see all that had happened since they last were there. So in they marched, Katie and Cece heading the procession, and Dory, with his great trailing bunch of boys, bringing up the rear. "'Oh, there is the dear Rosary, all safe!' cried the children, as they reached the top of the Hill of Difficulty, and came upon a tall stump, out of the middle of which waved a wild rose-bush, budded over with fresh green leaves. This rosary was a fascinating thing to their minds. They were always inventing stories about it, and were in constant terror, lest some hungry cow should take a fancy to the rose-bush and eat it up. "'Yes,' said Katie, stroking the leaf with her finger. "'It was in great danger one night last winter, but it escaped.' "'Oh, hi! Tell us about it!' cried the others, for Katie's stories were famous in the family. "'It was Christmas Eve,' continued Katie, in a mysterious tone. "'The fairy of the rosary was quite sick. She had taken a dreadful cold in her head, and the poplar tree fairy, just over there, told her that sassafras tea is good for coals. So she made a large acorn cup full, and then cuddled herself in where the wood looked so black and soft, and fell asleep.' In the middle of the night, when she was snoring soundly, there was a noise in the forest, and a dreadful black bull with fiery eyes galloped up. He saw our poor rosy posy, and, opening his big mouth, he was just about to bite her in two. But at that moment, a little fat man, with a wand in his hand, popped out from behind the stump. It was Santa Claus, of course. He gave the bull such a rap with his wand that he mooed dreadfully and then put up his forepaw to see if his nose was on or not. He found it was, but it hurt him so much that he mooed again, and galloped off as fast as he could farther into the woods. Then Santa Claus waked up the fairy, and told her that if she didn't take better care of Rosy Posy, he should put some other fairy in her place, and set her to keep guard over a prickly, scratchy blackberry bush. "'Is there really any fairy?' asked Dory. He had listened to this narrative with open mouth. "'Of course,' answered Katie. Then, bending down towards Dory, she added in a voice intended to be of wonderful sweetness, "'I 
am a fairy, Dory. Pshaw, was Dory's reply. You are a giraffe. Papa said so. The path of peace got its name because of its darkness and coolness. High bushes almost met over it, and trees kept it shady, even in the middle of the day. A sort of white flower grew there, which the children called pollypots, because they didn't know the real name. They stayed a long while picking bunches of these flowers, and then John and Dar had to grab up an armful of sassafras roots, so that before they had fairly gone through Toadstool Avenue, Rabbit Hollow, and the rest, the sun was just over their heads, and it was noon. I'm getting hungry, said Dory. Oh, no, Dory, you mustn't be hungry till the bar is ready, cried the little girls, alarmed, for Dory was apt to be disconsolate if he was kept waiting for meals. So they made haste to build the bower. It did not take long, being composed of boys hung over skipping ropes, which were tied to the very poplar tree where the fairy lived who had recommended sassafras tea to the fairy of the rose. When it was done, they all cuddled in underneath. It was a very small bar, just big enough to hold them, and the baskets, and the kitten. I don't think there would have been room for anybody else. Not even another kitten. Katie, who sat in the middle, untied and lifted the lid of the largest basket, while all the rest peeped eagerly to see what was inside. First came a great many ginger cakes. These were carefully laid on the grass to keep till wanted. Buttered biscuits came next, three apiece, with slices of cold lamb laid in between, and last of all were a dozen hard-boiled eggs, and a layer of thick bread and butter sandwiched with corned beef. Aunt Dizzy had put up lunches for paradise before, you see, and knew pretty well what to expect in the way of appetite. Oh, how good everything tasted in that boar, with the fresh wind rustling the poplar leaves, sunshine and sweet wood smells about them, and birds singing overhead. No grown-up dinner party ever had half so much fun. Each mouthful was a pleasure, and when the last crumb had vanished, Kitty produced the second basket, and there, oh, delightful surprise, were seven little pies, molasses pies, baked in saucers, each with a brown top and crisp candified edge, which tasted like toffee and lemon peel and all sorts of good things mixed up together. There was a general shout. Even demure Cece was pleased, and Dory and John kicked their heels on the ground in a tumult of joy. Seven pairs of hands were held out at once towards the basket. Seven sets of teeth went to work without a moment's delay. In an incredibly short time every vestige of pie had disappeared, and a blissful stickiness pervaded the party. "'What shall we do now?' asked Clover, while little Phil tipped the baskets upside down, as if to make sure there was nothing left that could possibly be eaten. "'I don't know,' replied Kitty, dreamily. She had left her seat, and was half sitting, half lying on the low, crooked boy of a butternut tree, which hung almost over the children's heads. "'Let's play we're grown up,' said Cece, "'and tell what we mean to do.' "'Well,' said Clover, "'you begin. What do you mean to do?' I mean to have a black silk dress, and pink roses in my bonnet, and a white muslin long shawl, said Cece. And I mean to look exactly like Minerva Clark. I shall be very good too, as good as Mrs. Bedell, only a great deal prettier. All the young gentlemen will want me to go and ride, but I shan't notice them at all, because, you know, I shall always be teaching in Sunday school, and visiting the poor. And some day, when I am bending over an old woman and feeding her with currant jelly, a poet will come along and see me, and he'll go home and write a poem about me," concluded Cece triumphantly. Pooh! said Clover. I don't think that would be nice at all. I am going to be a beautiful lady, the most beautiful lady in the world. And I am going to live in a yellow castle, with yellow pillars to the portico, and a square thing on top, like Mr. Sawyer's. My children are going to have a playhouse up there. There's going to be a spyglass in the window to look out of. I shall wear gold dresses and silver dresses every day, and diamond rings, and have white satin aprons to tie on when I'm dusting or do anything dirty. In the middle of my back yard there will be a pond full of eau de cologne, and whenever I want any I shall just go out and dip a ball in. And I shan't teach in Sunday schools like Cece because I don't want to. But every Sunday I'll go and stand by the gate, 
and when her scholars go by on their way home, I'll put eau de cologne on their handkerchiefs. I mean to have just the same, cried Elsie, whose imagination was fired by this gorgeous vision. Only my pond will be the biggest. I shall be a great deal beautifuler, too, she added. You can't, said Katie from overhead. Clover is going to be the most beautiful lady in the world. But I'll be more beautiful than the most beautiful, persisted poor Elsie. And I'll be big, too, and know everybody's secrets. And every one will be kind to me, and never run away and hide, and there won't be any post offices or anything disagreeable. What'll you be, Johnny? asked Clover, anxious to change the subject, for Elsie's voice was growing plaintive. But Johnny had no clear ideas as to her future. She laughed a great deal, and squeezed Dory's arm very tight, but that was all. Dory was more explicit. I mean to have turkey every day, he declared. And batter puddings, not boiled ones, you know, but little baked ones with brown shiny tops, and a great deal of pudding sauce to eat in them. And I shall be so big that nobody will say, Three helps is quite enough for a little boy. Oh, Dory, you pig! cried Katy, while the others screamed with laughter. Dory was much affronted. I shall just go and tell Aunt Izzy what you called me, he said, getting up in a great pet. But Clover, who was a born peacemaker, caught hold of his arm, and her coaxing and entreaties consoled him so much that he finally said he would stay, especially as the others were quite grave now, and promised that they wouldn't laugh any more. And now, Katie, it's your turn, said Cece. Tell us what you're going to be when you grow up. I'm not sure about what I'll be, replied Katie from overhead. Beautiful, of course, and good if I can. Only not so good as you, Cece. "'because it would be nice to go and ride with the young gentleman sometimes. "'And I'd like to have a large house and splendiferous garden, "'and then you could all come and live with me, and we would play in the garden. "'And Dory should have turkey five times a day if he liked, "'and we'd have a machine to darn the stockings, "'and another machine to put the bureau drawers in order, "'and we'd never sew or knit garters or do anything we didn't want to. "'That's what I'd like to be. "'But now I'll tell you what I mean to do.' "'Isn't it the same thing?' asked Cece. "'Oh, no,' replied Katie. "'Quite different. "'For, you see, I mean to do something grand. "'I don't know what yet, but when I'm grown up I shall find out.' "'Poor Katie always said, when I'm grown up, "'forgetting how very much she had grown already. "'Perhaps,' she went on, "'it will be rowing out in boats and saving people's lives, "'like that girl in the book.' "'Or perhaps I shall go and nurse in the hospital, like Miss Nightingale. "'Or else I'll head a crusade and ride on a white horse with armour and a helmet on my head, "'and carry a sacred flag. "'Or if I don't do that, I'll paint pictures, or sing, or scalp, scalp, what is it? "'You know, make figures in marble. "'Anyhow, it shall be something. "'And when Aunt Izzy sees it, and reads about me in the newspapers, she will say, "'The dear child!' I always knew she would turn out an ornament to the family. People very often say afterward that they always knew, concluded Katy sagaciously. Oh, Katy, how beautiful it will be, said Clover, clasping her hands. Clover believed in Katy, as she did in the Bible. I don't believe the newspapers will be so silly as to print things about you, Katy Carr, put in Elsie vindictively. Yes, they will, said Clover and give Elsie a push. By and by, John and Dory trotted away on mysterious errands of their own. "'Wasn't Dory funny with his turkey?' remarked Cece, and they all laughed again. "'If you won't tell,' said Katy, "'I'll let you see Dory's journal. He kept it once for almost two weeks, and then gave it up. I found the book this morning in the nursery closet.' All of them promised, and Katy produced it from her pocket. It began thus. March 12th, have resolved to keep a journal. March 13th, had roast beef for dinner and cabbage and potato and apple sauce and rice pudding. I do not like rice pudding when it is like ours. Charlie Slack's kind is really good. Mush and syrup for tea. March 19th, forget what did. John and me saved our pie to take to school. March 21st, forget what did. Griddle cakes for breakfast. 
Debbie didn't fry enough. March 24th. This is Sunday. Corn beef for dinner. Studied my Bible lesson. Aunt Izzy said I was greedy. How resolved not to think so much about things to eat. Wish I was a better boy. Nothing particular for tea. March 25th. Forget what did. March 27th. Forget what did. March 29th. Played. March 31st. Forget what did. April 1st. Have decided not to keep a journal any more. Here ended the extracts, and it seemed as if only a minute had passed since they stopped laughing over them, before the long shadows began to fall, and Mary came to say that all of them must come in to get ready for tea. It was dreadful to have to pick up the empty baskets and go home, feeling that the long, delightful Saturday was over, and that there wouldn't be another for a week. But it was comforting to remember that paradise was always there, and at any moment, when Fate and Aunt Izzy were willing, they had only to climb a pair of bars, very easy ones, and without any fear of an angel with flaming sword to stop the way, enter in and take possession of their eating. End of chapter 2